Hello, and welcome to the documentary, Founding Fathers and Grandfathers. So before we get started, I do have to say that I can't swear that this is all 100% accurate, as you basically have someone who just got her master's degree in making things up driving the bus here, but I tried my hardest and did a lot of research on this into both our historical roots and the historical significance of those roots. But the real reason that I decided to put this documentary together after doing all this research is that we have such a fascinating history, but also that this history starts right here, right here in Virginia, not so much on the wine deck, but in Virginia. Like, the, our country was founded here and this is where our family started and it seems super lazy of me not to just kind of go out and look for those roots right here. So please sit back and enjoy meeting our family. First, a little refresher course in the family genealogy. I mean, I'm sure you remember from reading the scintillating bestseller, To Be or Not To Be, a dudek, that all of the exciting stuff in our family pretty much comes down from Hattie Durain Hagen, or as she was known before her two marriages, Hattie Salita Franklin. Hattie, who was Grand Bird's mother, is the daughter of Oliver B. Franklin and Margaret Maggie Powell. The Franklins and the Powells are both very important names in our family history, so this right here is our jumping off point. Well, we've got to start somewhere, and even though this is kind of the middle of the history of the family and the middle of the history of everything, it's the one closest to my house. We're about 17 miles from where I live right now, and we're in Greene County, the adjacent to Albemarle County, and we're right down the street from the homestead of Lawrence Franklin. The first of the Franklins came to America sometime between 1634 and 1655. John Franklin settled along the Rappahannock River, one of two main areas of settlement in Virginia. His son, John Jr., was born in the colony in 1655. The younger John Franklin moved inland from the river to a place called Albemarle County, which is where I live right now, sometime before 1694, before the family relocated a few miles away in Greene County. Uh, this is the beginning of the Dudek history, right here in Virginia. The Franklins weren't the only branch of the family to have traveled upriver and lived along the banks of the Rappahannock. John Mills, who was either born in England in 1615 or was actually born in Virginia in 1626, depending on who you ask, was another. What is known about John Mills is that he was a frontier rifleman. He and his wife, Sarah Gregory, lived on the very edge of old Rappahannock County. The area is known today for its oysters, but back then it was known for being at the very edge of civilization. Being a frontier rifleman, he was tasked with the protection of his family and his neighbors from a variety of threats. For the purposes of this film, we're going to focus on our favorite threat, but more likely he was tasked with protecting his charges from a much more human element. Do not discount bears, though. The Virginia and North Carolina coasts are still filled with them even today. Back in the 17th century, bears would have been one of the bigger wildlife threats to the settlers. So let's just believe that is what John Mills was on the lookout for. So I've made my way to North Farnham Parish, which is in the northern neck of Virginia, in Richmond County, though it's nowhere near Richmond, Virginia. And as you can see from the sign behind me, uh, North Farnham Parish was founded in 1683, which was the same year that our relative John Mills and his wife Sarah were part of the founding families here in North Farnham Parish. Uh, we're actually here by the Episcopal Church, which has been here uh, since the 17th century. And uh, most of uh, this building that's here right now was actually built in the 18th century, but still a little bit more authentic. We'll uh, zoom on over here. Uh, you can see it behind me. Ah! There it is. John and Sarah had a son named John, who married a girl from Farnham Parish named Hester. John and Hester Mills had then had a daughter named, you'll never guess, Hester, who married into the Hanks family about 1700. The Hanks family is an interesting offshoot because of Lucy, our second cousin seven times removed, who had a daughter in 1784 named Nancy. Now, Nancy would move all the way to Indiana after marrying a fellow named Thomas Lincoln. In 1809, they had a son named Abe, our fourth cousin five times removed. Another fun side note about this, Tom Hanks is a direct line descendant of those same Hankses. 
I should probably pause for a moment and explain the math of ancestral connections. Most of the people in this film are straight line connections, as in a grandparent to some nth degree. But when there are super exciting Abraham Lincoln-esque connections, I will add it, then add in some extinct cousins who are billion times removed. What this means is the lower the cousin level, such as a first or second cousin, the closer they are to being a real relative. The number of times removed just deals with how far back in history someone is. For instance, Wills and Harry are 18th cousins, so they are on the same even plane age-wise, but are extremely far removed from being actual family. Now let's take a short 15-hour walk and hop back a generation to another church on another branch of the family history and meet the Gwyns. So we're here in Gloucester, Virginia at the Ware Episcopal Church. The Ware Episcopal Church as it stands right now is a 19th century building. Most of the graves here in this, in this graveyard are also from the 19th century. Uh, it's rumored that most of the Gwyns are buried here, but that's not actually the case. However, our ancestor, Reverend John Gwyn, was one of the initial pastors or rectors of this particular parish. Uh, he was followed by Reverend James Clark, who is buried on the premise, and he's actually been visited by his seventh great granddaughters. So uh, not the only one roaming through various parts of Virginia right now looking for ancestors. So the Reverend John and his wife Maggie uh, came to this church uh, from Gwynn's Island, and he was only the pastor here for a short period of time, a couple of years, uh, but this is where they ended up. Their daughter, daughter Catherine, eventually went on to my, marry Michael Guinea, and the two of them moved just a few miles down the road to King and Queen County. Uh, the, their great granddaughter, or I'm sorry, the uh, Reverend John's great, 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 great granddaughter, Sarah Yates, would go on to marry Owen Franklin, who was the son of Lawrence Franklin who we heard about earlier. All paths lead to the Franklins, but we're not gonna go back there, at least not for right now. Instead, we're gonna stay here with the Gwyns and pop over to a place called Gwyns Island. As the sign says, welcome to Gwyns Island, which is otherwise known as our island. Here we go. Gwyns Island is a, um, well, island, two miles long and one mile wide near the mouth of the Pihanatuck and Rappahannock Rivers off Chesapeake Bay. It was awarded as a land grant in 1642 to Colonel Hugh Gwynn, the father of the Reverend John Gwynn. Colonel Gwynn was born in 1608 in Wales of the House of Gwithir. Once again, as being a further down the line child, he was not set to inherit title or land, so he cast his lot in becoming a sailor, more specifically the captain of a ship, because though he didn't have all the money, he still had some, or at least enough of daddy's favor to buy him a ship. The colonel was, according to the official registers, granted the land now known as Gwyn's Island as payment for bringing 19 settlers to the colony. However, there is a much more colorful version of the story that we prefer. Once upon a time, specifically the summer of 1634, a brave sailor man named Hugh Gwynne traveled from a faraway land of Milford Haven, Wales, to the tiny colony of Jamestown. But Colonel Gwynne, he was an adventurous man, so he and some of his, we'll call them pals, decided to take a small boat upriver, and they landed at the island that would someday be called Gwynnesville. While admiring the beauty of his surroundings and the rich fertility of the island soil, he saw a young woman in a small dugout canoe paddling toward the island. It was a blustery day and the waters were rough. A killer rogue wave smashed into the canoe and dumped the girl into the water. Colonel Gwynne and his pals bravely headed out to rescue the girl from drowning. After saving her, the colonel asked her, who she was and why she was out all alone on the water, especially with those killer rogue waves everywhere. I am the daughter of Chief Piankatank, and I have come to worship the great spirit on the island. But as you have saved my life, I give this island to you as a token of my gratitude. The, the colonel, well, probably his pals, 
Roro rowed his boat back to Jamestown and made a formal request of the King of England to be given the land. He moved his whole family, his wife, two sons, a daughter, and all of their puppets to the island where he built a cabin and named it Gwynsville. And they lived happily ever after. The colonel is also credited with being the first settler of Gloucester and Matthews County in 1635. He was also granted 6,000 acres of land along the Potomac and 700 acres of land on the Isle of Wight. He also had a parcel of land in York County where he was the Justice of the Peace and the representative to the House of Burgess of a long-forgotten town called Standards, Virginia. Colonel Gwynn passed away in 1654 and was buried somewhere on his island. Jamestown. We've name-dropped it a couple of times, but now it's time to take a deep look at its history. The story of our family in America begins there, as does the story of America itself. However, I won't bore you with the visuals from a truly disappointing tourist trap. For somewhere that is the actual seed of a nation, the site is shamefully inadequate, one crappy museum and a fake ship. Instead, we will use the wonderful paintings of Sidney E. King to illustrate the tale. The first true colony was established in 1607 at Jamestown by the Virginia Company. The privately funded corporation built a fort at the mouth of the James River, but 80% of the first party died due to a drought in the area the year that they landed. The survivors didn't have the best go of things once the rains returned, either. Much of the colony was wiped out by attacks by, as they were referred to at the time, Indians in 1610. The colony suffered another brutal Indian attack in 1622. Some 6,000 people arrived in Jamestown between 1608 and 1624. Only 3,400 survived. One of those survivors was Benjamin Harrison. Benjamin Harrison, our 10th great-grandfather, was born in 1575 in Northamptonshire, England, and came early to Jamestown, though the date is not known. His wife Mary may have been a native of Virginia, but there are some conflicting reports on that. What is known is that they both survived the Good Friday Massacre of 1622. At the time, there were 1,240 inhabitants in eight different settlements along the James River. In a series of coordinated attacks, 347 settlers were killed that day. Ben was quite an important figure in the colony. He was named the Clerk of the Council of Virginia in 1633 and then became a member of the House of Burgess in 1642. He was given 200 acres of land on which he built one of the first great stately homes in Virginia, an estate he called Wakefield. It no longer exists today because it was burned to the ground by Benedict Arnold during the American Revolution. Our direct line ancestor, William, was born three years after the Good Friday Massacre and was a later son of Benjamin and Mary. It was their eldest son, Benjamin II, who inherited the property and most of the family wealth, and it is through Benjamin's line that the well-known elements of the Harrison family come. So we're here at Berkeley Plantation, which is the family home of the Harrison clan. Benjamin Harrison II uh, was the brother of our ancestor. Benjamin Harrison III was the one who initially acquired the Berkeley land. Benjamin Harrison IV was the one who built the house that you see behind you. So uh, Benjamin Harrison V was the one who signed the Declaration of Independence, became a governor of Virginia eventually, was the patriot that everyone knows, uh, and he was our third cousin, a zillion times removed. Uh, but this was his house, and then he was the father of William Henry Harrison, the first of our presidential cousins. Before we get too far ahead with the Declaration of Independence or the hot second that William Henry Harrison was president of our fine nation, a whopping 31 days if you need that in more precise terms, let's circle back to Jamestown and delve a little further into its history. The settlement suffered another series of Indian attacks from 1644 to 1646. Once that threat was minimized, it had some other misfortunes such as being burned to the ground. Twice. The first time was in 1676, and then it happened again in 1698. 
After the second time, the colonists finally cried uncle and the capital was moved further inland to Williamsburg. We're going to take a closer look at the fire that happened in 1676. And in order to do that, we need to meet one of our more notorious American ancestors, our ninth great-grandfather, Captain William Carver. Captain William Carver established the town of Portsmouth in 1659, but it's only the beginning of what makes him interesting. It's what gives him this uh, state historical marker right here behind me, uh, right next to an auto zone, but it's hardly the end of his story. So let's learn a lot about Captain William Carver. Captain Carver was a prominent merchant in Lower Norfolk County. He was named a justice in 1663, a member of the House of Burgess from 65 to 69, and a sheriff in 1670. However, Captain Carver possessed a volatile temper and may have indulged too frequently in the drink. On July 25th, 1672, while suffering from severe abdominal pains and perhaps taking alcohol to relieve those symptoms, Carver stabbed to death a man named Thomas Gilbert, who was sitting beside him at dinner. Several witnesses described Carver as behaving irrationally, and Carver later stated that he did not remember anything about the incident or the several days before and after the stabbing. In his examination on August 15, 1672, he deposed that as for his part, he kneweth nothing of it, no more than the child that is now unborn, nor of any other action that day, nor several days before or after. A general court jury acquitted him of murder, presumably persuaded that he had been deranged and not responsible for his actions. Soon after Carver's return home from his trial in Jamestown, his treatment of his neighbors led the general court to order his arrest again. During a legal dispute three years later, he retaliated against his adversary, Lazarus Jenking, by accusing the man's wife, Joan, of practicing witchcraft, or, as the actual complaint read, being familiar with evil spirits and using witchcraft. The charge was tossed. Which leads us to 1676. In June of that year, Captain Carver appeared in Jamestown while the assembly was in session and requested a commission from Nathaniel Bacon to lead forces in a campaign against the Indians. Instead, Bacon appointed Carver and Giles Bland commanders of a naval force and in August ordered them to capture Governor Sir William Berkeley, who about that time had retreated to the eastern shore. The two men organized a flotilla of small boats and with several hundred men sailed into the lower Chesapeake Bay where they captured several small vessels and ships, including Thomas Larimore's 265-ton Rebecca. They found Berkeley on September 1st at Arlington, the Northampton County estate of John Custis. Carver went ashore with a force of more than 100 men, leaving Bland on board the Rebecca. Accounts of what happened next contain inconsistencies. Carver may have negotiated with Berkeley. The governor's men may have plied Carver with wine, or both. But Berkeley suddenly found himself with the upper hand. On the next day, the governor sees Carver, Bland, and the Rebecca and its crew. Bland and Carver apparently blamed each other for Berkeley's success, but a later commentator speculated that it was not Carver's treachery, but the, quote, juice of the grape that betrayed him and Bland into Berkeley's hands and doomed the expedition. Of the event, Berkeley wrote that Carver was a valiant, stout seaman taken miraculously. The governor hanged Carver and four other men within three or four days. He then moved swiftly to retake Jamestown, which he achieved on September 7th, 1676. This was the end of what the history books refer to as Bacon's Rebellion, the first wave of the American Revolution that happened a solid century before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. As for the fire of 1676... Governor Berkeley set parts of Jamestown aflame as retaliation for the uprising. Many of the conspirators of Bacon's Rebellion were later posthumously pardoned. Captain Carver was not one of them, though one of his sons, not the one we are direct descendant of, of course, did eventually successfully petition to regain some of the family lands, but only a very small portion. The Carvers eventually moved inland in Virginia near the present-day North Carolina border, there is a slightly neglected family cemetery located along a windy back country road that with one good hop of a fence can still be visited. Most of the markers are 19th century or later, but one can still pay one's respects to a variety of cousins.
Speaking of graveyards, no trip to historical Virginia would be complete without a trip to Smithfield in the Isle of Wight County and a trip to St. Luke's. St. Luke's Church, built in 1632, is affectionately known as the Old Brick. It is the oldest surviving church of English foundation in America in the only original Gothic church in the USA. There are between 300 and 500 unmarked 17th century through 19th century human remains interred inside and around the church building and hundreds more interred in marked grave sites. One of the people rumored to be buried at St. Luke's is Colonel Joseph Bridger. The colonel represented the Isle of Wight in the House of Burgess and was, according to some sources, the co-acting colonial governor of Virginia in 1684 and 1685. To us, he is a 10th great-grandfather. We have about a dozen relatives that were among the early settlers in the Isle of Wight. It's where most of our American family lived. So let's take a look at its history. In 1607, John Smith, not a relative, crossed the James River to trade with the Warashaic Indians, the native inhabitants of the Isle of Wight. In 1619, the first permanent English settlement was built here. In 1634, the Warashaic County was formed with a population of about 500 English residents. In 1637, the name was changed to the Isle of Wight, naming it after the island off the coast of England. Colonel Bridges' daughter, Mary Marie, married a man called William Pope in the Isle of Wight, the American version, in 1662. William Pope had arrived in Virginia as a young man of 20 years in 1655, choosing to make the trip over three years after the death of his father in Gloucester, England. After seven years in the colony, he wed Mary, and they quickly had a son named, you'll never guess, William. We're going to leave the idyllic rivers of Virginia, the beleaguered Jamestown, the frontiers of the Rappahannock, the Isle of Wight, and the Bears, and follow the Pope family down to North Carolina. William Pope Jr.'s son, William Pope, was the one to head south and did so in about 1700. His grandson named, oh, you'll never guess, William Pope, is the one that we're going to focus on. So let's join his story in progress and meet up with William Pope at the age of 31. The year is 1776. You're getting excited now, right? Because you know this bit. Who doesn't know the story of the American Revolution? Boston Tea Parties, Paul Revere, Redcoats, King George, George Washington, my boy TJ, you know, Thomas Jefferson founder of my employer, the University of Virginia, and my neighbor 10 miles up the road at Monticello. That dude. But the story of the revolution that we're going to look at is how it pertains to three of our ancestors, William Pope, Moses Powell, and John Stell. William Pope and Moses Powell were neighbors in Wake County, North Carolina, which is near modern-day Raleigh. As you can see from William Pope's will filed in August of 1818, there were several Pope and Powell weddings over the years, and several more William Popes to come. It's through a wedding between the two families, specifically that of Henry Powell and Polly Pope in 1792, that gives us dual Pope-Powell lineage. So let's get to what we came for and look at their military service. Moses Powell served 84 months on the Continental Line. In addition to earning a salary, he was given 640 acres of land for his service at the end of the war. William Pope served for 40 months and was given 365 acres of land. As I was working on this documentary, an interesting anomaly has surfaced. The DAR believes that it is our fifth great-grandfather, Moses Powell, born in 1730, that fought in the war. I, however, have found a headstone that feels it was Moses Powell Jr., our fifth great uncle who served. Or maybe it was one at one point and then it became the other Moses Powell. 84 months is a pretty long service time, so that is possible. But at this point, and this is literally all that I know about the Paul's service, so it is actually going to be through William Pope that we will look at our ties to the American War of Independence. William Pope enlisted in 1777 and was a member of the 2nd North Carolina Regiment, commanded by Colonel John Patton in Lieutenant Colonel Harney's company. 
One would imagine that Moses Powell was also a member of the same unit as they were neighbors, but I do not have a definitive record of which North Carolina regiment he served in. From December of 1775 through May of 1777, the North Carolina regiments remained in the South. But shortly after William Pope's enlistment, the 2nd North Carolina Regiment was ordered north to join the troops under General George Washington. The North Carolina Brigade marched through Williamsburg and Richmond and paused at Alexandria to undergo inoculations for smallpox. In July and August, the troops were marched northward into New Jersey and then again south to Wilmington, Delaware, to help counter a British thrust towards Philadelphia from the south. The North Carolina Brigade was at the Battle of Brandywine, Pennsylvania on September 11, 1777, but saw little action as it had been assigned to the reserves under Major General Nathaniel Green. The North Carolina Brigade was also involved in the Battle of Germantown on October 4, 1777, where it again formed the reserve along with the Corps of Light Infantry. The actions at Brandywine in Germantown left the regiments in need of a commanding general, with command eventually being given to Brigadier General Lackland McKintock as it went into winter quarters with the rest of the Continental Army at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Yes, it was that winter at that Valley Forge. Troop returns for the North Carolina Brigade at Valley Forge for January of 1778 give an idea of the suffering they endured. Out of 1,188 men, 323 were listed as sick and 249 as unfit for duty for want of clothing. General George Washington declared that the North Carolina Brigade was sicklier than any other unit at Valley Forge, and that was definitely saying something. Those who survived the winter at Valley Forge went on to see action at the Battle of Monmouth in New Jersey that next summer. The Battle of Monmouth is celebrated with a historical reenactment every June and which, if you are a true glutton for punishment, can be viewed as an eight-part series on YouTube. On June 28, 1878, the 2nd North Carolina Regiment fought as part of Scott's division in the Marquis de Lafayette's Brigade. This was the biggest battle of the war for the North Carolina 2nd. Although the American Army outnumbered its foe 2-1, to one, Major General Charles Lee, who launched the initial attack, lacked confidence in the ability of the Continental soldiers under his command. In failing to press his advantage, Lee ceded the initiative to his British counterpart, General Cornwallis. What began as a promising opportunity devolved into a potential disaster. As Washington approached the fighting, he encountered panic-stricken troops fleeing the enemy. Enraged, he galloped ahead of his wing. In an angry confrontation on the field of battle, Washington removed Lee from command. Rallying what troops he had, Washington continued the assault on the British. The commanding general's delaying action gave time for the rest of the Continental Army to come up and join the battle. Washington placed General Nathaniel Green's division on the right and the division of General William Alexander Lord Sterling on the left. Lee's men, including the North Carolina 2nd, were turned over to the Marquis de Lafayette, who kept those troops in reserve. General Mad Anthony Wayne assumed control over the other elements of Lee's force and manned Lafayette's front. Artillery was placed on both flanks. The fighting seesawed back and forth under the brutal June sun for several hours. By 6 p.m., however, the British had had enough. While Wayne wanted to press the attack, Washington demurred, believing that his men were beat out with heat and fatigue. The British did not give Washington a chance to renew the fight that morning, slipping away under the cover of darkness and resuming their withdrawal to New York City. So why is this battle, which is considered a draw, an important moment of history? It was actually the last time the two main armies would face off on a battlefield. June 28, 1778 was the last full battle of the war fought between just the British and the Americans. The war would last until 1783, grinding on for a total of eight years, four months, and 15 days. The Treaty of Paris that ended the war wasn't fully ratified until May 1784. But the Battle of Monmouth was the last major battle between the British and American forces. Moses Powell was most likely in the Continental Army for the rest of the war, 
while William Pope retired back to North Carolina sometime in 1780. Now let's take a look at the service of our third Revolutionary War veteran, John Stell. John Stell was originally from Virginia, but moved to Newbury, South Carolina, and served in the 96th District Regiment of his adopted state. 96 sounds like the number of a regiment, but it's actually a place. 96 South Carolina is about 60 miles south of Greenville and earned its name because it was said to be 96 miles from the Cherokee. Stell, like Pope and Powell, was a private in the army. However, unlike North Carolina, where most of the troops headed north to serve, South Carolina was an active battleground during the war. 96 itself was a site of two different sieges. The first siege of 96 took place from November 19th through 21st of 1775. Yes, 1775. Though we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence that happened on July 4th, 1776, the war actually began in April of 75. By August of 75, tensions down south began to build with both South Carolina patriots and the British loyalist starting militias. It was initially just isolated tarring and featherings, but by the fall, things had devolved, causing more serious incidents. The siege of 96 that took place that year was an attempt to recover a shipment of gunpowder and ammunition seized by the Loyalists. 560 Patriots surrounded a stronghold, but 1,900 Loyalist troops headed to the rescue. The Patriots withdrew the siege after two days of fighting in what is called a draw by the history books. There were a combined five killed and 13 wounded in the fighting, which basically comprised just of long-range shooting. The second siege of 96 came later in the war. From May 22nd to June 18th, 1781, Continental Army Major Nathaniel Green led 1,000 troops in siege against 550 Loyalists in the fortified village. The 28-day siege centered on an earthen fortification known as Star Fort for reasons that you can see from this aerial footage of the site that I've borrowed from YouTube. Despite having more troops, Green was unsuccessful in taking the town and was forced to lift the siege when Lord Rawdon approached from Charleston with 2,000 fresh British troops. On January 17, 1781, the regiment fought in the Battle of Cowpens. Mel Gibson and some of his pals have volunteered to do a reenactment for us. Thanks, fellas! In what would become a classic military victory, one of the most famous of the war, Brigadier General Daniel Morgan led his army of tough Continentals and backwoods militia to a victory over Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton's battle-hardened force of British regulars. The Battle of Cowpens lasted a little over an hour, but was a complete victory for the Patriot force. British losses were staggering, 110 dead, over 200 wounded, and 500 captured. Only 12 of Morgan's force were killed and 60 wounded. It was the turning point of the war in the South, part of a chain of events leading to the Patriot victory at Yorktown and the surrender of Cornwallis. John Stell served from April 1781 until April 1782 as a member of Lieutenant Colonel John Thomas's Regiment of Dragoons, which was part of General Sumter's brigade. He was most likely deployed to Cape Fear. Dragoons were regarded as medium cavalry. Whereas regular cavalry did most of their fighting on horse, dragoons rode into battle and then did most of their fighting dismounted, although they were actually trained to fight both ways. The term dragoon came from the nickname for their weapon, the carbine or short musket called the dragon, which referred to the fire that emits out of the gun when fired, hence the term dragon or dragoon soldiers. South Carolina endured bitter internal strife between patriots and loyalists during the war as it had one of the strongest loyalist factions of any state. About 5,000 men took up arms against the Patriot government during the Revolution, and 1,000 more were supporters who avoided taxes, sold supplies to the British, and who avoided conscription. John Stell's wife, Susan Malone, was the daughter of Robert Dennis Malone, one of the Loyalists who had part of his lands confiscated during the conflict. Robert Malone died in 1779, before the end of the war. 
John Stell, however, survived the war, passing away from a fever in 1790 in Effingham County, Georgia, near Savannah. His death came three years after his grandson, George, was born. George had a daughter, Salida, who was born in 1823. Salida Carolyn Stell married John Ambrose Franklin on March 12, 1836. Salida lived to a ripe old age and was still alive in 1891 when what one has to believe was a namesake granddaughter, Hattie Salida Franklin, was born. So the question becomes, what does this all mean? Well, here's a good answer for you. Oh no. <laughs> so, I mean, it really all depends on what you want it to mean. For me personally, three years ago, if you had told me that our family was one of the founding families of this country, I never would have believed it. I didn't know any of this. When you look at Joe's research, he lists gram great grandma Hattie as British, which is the biggest O for simplification of all time. Uh, but also, like, he did all of his genealogy research well before Ancestry.com. Like, it really hurts me that he was not here to have access to all the records that I had access to. I mean, Ancestry.com is kind of a double edged sword, which gets us also back to how much of this is true. So there's a lot of problems with misspellings, people who spell their names two different ways uh, because of illiteracy, penmanship issues, just general record keeping in the actual historical records. And then you add in there the Ancestry.com where sometimes leaps and bounds taken by other people can turn into factual information on their site. So I can't attest for how much of some of this stuff is real. Like, are we actually related to, to, the, to Mr. Carver? I mean, also, do we want to be related to Mr. Carver? Granted, he was a, an important historical figure who, I don't know, went around stabbing people, accusing them of witchcraft, and also being so drunk that he lost a hundred to one advantage in, during Bacon's Rebellion. So uh, luckily with him, it's a little spotty as to whether or not we actually are related to him. But when it comes to the Franklins and the Popes, that, that math is solid. Like, it is, it's real. I can get us back uh, without much question to the Isle of Wight and to Jamestown, which is what brings me to the conclusion that I do have for you, which is that it may not have been the exact people that are in this documentary, but it would have definitely been their contemporaries. This was the world where our family began. We've been here since the 17th century, and I know that I had a great deal of pride when I discovered that we had the three Revolutionary War soldiers within our, with, within our, our family. And to be able to pull up their actual war records and see what they did. I mean, we were part of Valley Forge. Our people were there with George Washington. Granted, we were also part of the problem at Valley Forge, but we fought at Valley Forge. That's our family, that's our legacy. And to drive around Virginia and see all the places that we've touched, and even living here right now in Albemarle County, the Franklins were here. This is our history. And this has been my joy to share it with you. And I'll just leave you to draw your own conclusions and what to make of it. But thank you for visiting the Dudex in America.